So, hello everyone, and thank you to the committee members of Tata Literature Live for curating this session. I think the topic of the, the merchants of Bombay is quite well established in our city's cultural life. Um, and the five, the group of five founding merchant princes of Bombay have really come to symbolize Bombay's cosmopolitanism. Jamshed Jijiji Boy, David Sassoon, Jagannath Sankar Seth, uh, Mohammed Ali Rogai, Roger Faria, and as each of their names suggests, they belong to five of the leading faiths of the city. Um, there have been two recent histories, global histories of the Sassoons that have been recently published. There has been a comprehensive uh, article on Mohammed Ali Rogai. Um, there has been an earlier monograph on Jamshed Jijiji Boy. And Jagannath Shankar Seth, as all of you may know, is commemorated and celebrated and claimed in the city in, in many, many ways on a really regular basis. Um, I think what makes Sifra's book, Mercantile Bombay, really refreshing is that she chooses to focus on a whole new set of merchants who she calls internal migrants, so they come from different parts of India, largely Gujarat, come to Bombay, and then branch out and go to Oman, go to East Africa, and make their fortunes there, while keeping their base and different branches of the com and a branch of the company in Bombay. So, Sifra, my first question to you is, is why did you turn to these merchants, and was there a little Sethya fatigue with all the big five setyas, uh, you know, commemorated in different ways. You know, Samin, actually, I uh, didn't... It's working? Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. I didn't really think in terms of the setyas. Actually, uh, when I began writing the book, I had to look at the city from... A geopolitical and geoeconomic point of view. That means I had to look from outside in. Now, when you look from outside in, you have to see what made the city tick and what made it an international city, which it was after in the 19th century and the early half of the 20th century. That's when I began looking at internal migrants. Because we do know the big names amongst migrant communities, but the big names could only function through community networks and through collaboration with other communities. You see, like, for example, I was uh, studying the Armenian community recently, and they sort of languished in Bombay. 18th century was their peak time. But I realized there's this wonderful book written on the Armenians by David Eslanian. And he said that the Armenians were a very insular trading network. They did not take in outsiders very easily. So if you don't take in outsiders very easily and you don't collaborate with outsiders, then you tend to sort of atrophy. So that's when I started looking at internal migrants, started looking at how they sort of built overseas networks, what were the networks in their villages that they came from or towns they came from, and how did they collaborate with other communities. So that's how the internal migrants came in. And they were also the middlemen for the foreign companies that came in. So that is important to really note. Right. Could, could you mention a few uh, families you traced or, the, or where they went? Or? Uh, you know, the families that I actually cover in the book, the East African, uh, I speak a lot about uh, the Karimchi family, which went to Zanzibar and then relocated in Tanzania, present-day Tanzania. And I spoke to the head of the family recently, when I was writing the book, he was in Switzerland. And uh, they've come out with a wonderful family history, which has been written by an uh, expert on East Africa and trading communities. So, but I did sort of look at that family in the context of other Indian trading communities who immigrated to East Africa. And I realized that actually they went to East Africa via Oman, most of them and why the Middle East. So they were not the only family. So you also had the Bhatia merchants, you also had the Bora and the Kojas. And they had prominent members amongst them. So a prominent Bora merchant was Ali, Ali Dina Vishram, who actually was a big merchant in Zanzibar and then 
when Kenya came under British rule or became a British protectorate, he shifted to Kenya and then Uganda and played a key role in the building of the Uganda railways. In the sense, he built a shop everywhere a new stretch of railways was being sort of placed. So that's how I sort of connected all the stories together and you get an overview. So it's not just concentrating on the big ones. From the big ones, you get the connections to the smaller merchants and the smaller layers, you know. The right from in, in Kenya, you hear about people who came to man the railways, the police people, personnel who were taken from Bombay presidency, the coolie labor that was taken, the supervisors who were taken, the administrators who were taken. So you have the entire East African Indian community. And now as we've seen, that a lot of the East Africans after, during the Africanization wave, went to London. And now we have Rishi Sunak and Preeti Patel. So you can actually trace that history from the 19th century right up to the present. So that is what this book attempts to do. It tries to give you a macro overview in which you can contextualize stories. And I've brought out the stories really to, I've, uh, you know, I've detailed the stories only to bring out the macro history. And Nadir, you know, the founder of Godridge Group, Areshar Godridge, um, could well have ended up in East Africa with <laughs> Sifra's merchants, and we could have been having this panel in Zanzibar. So, um, uh, Nadir, please tell us about his, his tryst with Zanzibar. And right. Our group began, as you all know, 125 years ago. It started with our illustrious founder. We couldn't have asked for someone sounder. Though just a lawyer by profession, invention was his strong obsession. His first case was in Zanzibar. And though he proved to be a star, the fact that he was forced to lie then made him feel he could not ply this dubious practice anymore as honesty was at his score. So values played a role for sure. We will ensure that they endure. Now, Mahatma Gandhi was a friend, and self-ruled then the future trend. Ardeshar once just pointed out that he still had a serious doubt that profound economic dependence might well preclude our independence, a point the Mahatma then conceded. But rather promptly, he proceeded to turn the tables on his friend and asked him to work to that end. And so he started up his venture, which proved to be some adventure. Ardesha's focus was invention. His single-minded intention was proving that he could do it. He could succeed, and he knew it. For Indian goods could be the best, surpassed the British by every test. He scorned the thought of protection and chose to prevail by perfection. And that he knew he could achieve. His customers could all perceive his products were the very best and constantly put to the test. To greater heights he would aspire, his safe survived ordeal by fire. Once in the harbor, a ship exploded. The, the outer walls of safes eroded. The inner contents were all intact. And even when thieves attacked, they could barely pit and dent. Sometimes the plates were slightly bent, but the safes would never break, and so the thieves could never take any goods his safes had secured. For years and years, his fame endured. There was no limit to his scope. He worked as hard in tackling soap. For many years, he tried his hand until he could well understand the ins and outs of making soap. To vegetarians, he gave hope. The other makers were all callow and made their soaps from lard and tallow. Not prime, but rendered in the street with the stink of rotten meat. But thanks to his determined toil, fine soap could now be made from oil. Thank you. All the cupboards and shelves are actually made of Burma teak. 
wood, but we really don't know much about it. So, so Sifra also throws great light on how, how this Bomba, Bombay Burma commodity, which is all around us but never really thought of, um, made its way here. You know, Samin, actually, a teak wood was uh, valuable. Actually, it grew in our hinterland, Bombay hinterland. So the Konkan region had teak wood forests. Mm -hmm. Of course, now we know that teak trees are protected. And uh, the Mysore region had teak forests, as well as the Malabar. Now, what happened was that the search for Burma teak actually began because Bombay had a well-known shipping industry, shipbuilding industry and uh, a lot of the tea from the Konkan forest and from further south started, started depleting. So all the companies, the European companies began looking a little further east to Burma and of course as I have mentioned in my book most of the wars that take place like the Anglo-Burmese war and even the Anglo-Mysore wars were actually trade wars. The British just used any excuse to really want to, you know, subjugate kingdoms. Either they did it through outright war, they did it through diplomacy, or, you know, whatever. So they wanted the commodities because they couldn't run this huge business without commodities. And that's how Burma Teak really comes in, was basically Bombay became a nodal port for the export of teak to China and to West Asia and also for its own shipbuilding industry and also for its railways. So most of the old sleepers in our Indian railways are all made out of Burma teak. So that's how I've sort of brought in teak because we all know that Bombay really grew because of the cotton trade and the China trade was of course the opium trade. But I discovered that it was also Burma teak passing through Bombay it was ivory from East Africa that passed through Bombay for a short while. Bombay was a transshipment port. It was spices from the Malabar that passed through the city after it became a big port city. So these are all the various sort of threads that I've tried to put together to show how Bombay became a shipping hub and an international commercial and financial center. Because if you have a shipping hub, then you need to have commercial and financial services to support everything. So these are the sort of, uh, you know, the threads that I have drawn together into showing how the city became an international trading center. Madam, to, to continue Arisha's journey, you've taken us to the safes and to his, his success. But between Zanzibar, no, is it yes, okay. Yeah. But between, between Zanzibar and the success of the manufacturing, so he comes back to Bombay, he gets into manufacturing of items and instruments that the founder thought would be, uh, that the, there was a public need for. So uh, could you tell us about his early forays into manufacturing and the struggles he faced? His first foray was into surgical instruments and he faced a lot of problems in them, particularly in marketing and that business failed. But uh, shortly thereafter he started making locks. And although he was a lawyer, he was a self-trained scientist. So he read a lot about rocks. Uh, later on, he also went to Europe uh, to uh, actually look at manufacturers. And uh, very carefully, he designed a lock that was very reliable, very safe. He did a lot of testing. And all of this was self-taught just as he developed the soap business later, entirely by his own research. So he, he was a self-made scientist, and the Knox business was very successful, and thereafter he moved on to the safe business, which was a natural corollary to that. And he had a very sad incident where his wife, who he had married a little while ago, went with a cousin, it's a very well-known story. They went up to the Rajabai clock tower. Somebody tried to assault them, and they jumped. Uh, he was very shocked, very despondent, but he refused to marry again, and uh, he decided to devote all his attention to his business. He was quite involved in the independence movement. He gave donations to Tilak Swaraj Fund, as well as Gandhi's Harijan Fund. He was one of the biggest donors. 
to these funds. And he didn't believe in leaving any inheritance. So uh, his uh, uh, steel products business he sold to his brother, my grandfather. Uh, and the soap business he donated to the Parsi Panchayat for the welfare of Parsis. They ran it into the ground and my grandfather bought it from them. <laughs> Rajabai clock tower case, which became, which he erupted. So, uh, in I suppose it's in his per personal grief for this very public outcry of the case, and I don't know if it was really ever solved in terms of why these two women jumped and whether they were being attacked and to sort of, you know, keep their modesty intact, they jumped or what the story was. But the Rajabai clock tower case has now been in the news. It has been fictionalized into into a book called Murder in Old Bombay by Nev March. And uh, there seems to be, there seem to be, you know, several mysteries now set in Bombay. And I think this uh, point about mysteries, mystery genre was also made at the opening of this festival by Kwasar Padamsi about how, you know, and Bombay seems to be the setting for many of these books. So my question to both of you all is, is, you know, what draws people to Bombay? You know, your migrants, contemporary artists, what is it about the city that um, that that keeps getting everyone here? Or <laughs> I think it's uh, Sydney. I think it's a mix that it's a port city, so it's got an underbelly. Yeah. yeah, it attracts people here for work. So you have all kinds of communities, all kinds of towns, all kinds of uh, costumes. Even today, I mean. Bombay, I think, is the most cosmopolitan city in India. I mean, you don't see this kind of mix anywhere else. And then uh, there's something which, in fact, you mentioned that, uh, which is really something, I mean, I looked into the consulates here and the communities that they attracted because uh, I realized that uh, every time a consulate would always be established in the city and Bombay had numerous, more, numerous consulates in the 19th century, second half of the 19th and early 20th century. And most of them closed down operations in our city after independence. And are all returned, they've all returned back, like the Swedish, the Norwegian, the Spanish consulate. And I realized that this was because of trade. If you have trade between two countries, you, they always have a trade attaché. Once the trade expands, the consulate comes. With the consulate comes a certain amount. There's a residential community from that, like the Japanese came, the uh, Italians were there, the Germans were here. So Bombay had these little, you know, foreign resident communities who added so much to our history and culture, art, literature. And when you have such a mix of people, both overseas and hinterland, I mean, you know, my internal migrants, Plus, you have a port where you have sailors and people coming. It makes the city more sort of nuanced and it's more exciting to write about it. And I think a lot of inspiration comes from the old cases that have taken place, you know, in the city. So, like, for example, as you mentioned, uh, the one about the Rajabai clock tower case has also come. It's a well-known case, but she's made fictionalized it, you know. So, I mean, Sujata Massey is another author who writes a lot about uh, Bombay and makes sure that the historical facts and the setting is accurate. But then she weaves her story around it, and there's always some inspiration from something that has happened in the city. So, city's got plenty of stories, really, to draw fiction, fiction writers. What is... Yes, yeah. I entirely agree with Sifra that it's the cosmopolitan nature of Bombay. It has people from all over the world and people from all over India, at least all over Western India and even Southern India and even Northern India. And uh, it's this mix that makes for a very exciting situation. It's also very interesting that there were lots of Europeans other than the English here. We often have a debate about Indian languages and English, uh, but uh, people may not realize that uh, there were a lot of people studying French in Mumbai. There's the Cercle Littéraire in, uh, uh, in Bombay. And I think sometimes, because we were fighting the British, we were in Bombay, we were more interested in other European cultures. 
and uh, you see there's a love of Western music in Bombay, and there's a love of Indian music in Bombay, and it's the combination of all these things that make Bombay very interesting, which makes Bombay so different from Delhi, and... Uh, <laughs> and... I like to call, uh, uh, if New York is the Big Apple, I like to call Bombay the Big Mango. <laughs> we have a commercial culture, but we have an artistic culture as well. And the artistic culture is often driven by the commercial culture. <laughs> Thank you. So for, you have, you know, you mentioned so many communities and in Bombay, and the Japanese were very interesting. They seem to be a late community. Um, and then the profile of this community, there is high executives, there is some priestly class, and then there are sex workers. And it was fascinating, and could you just tell us about the Japanese in Bombay? In the, in the period you... Yes. Uh, actually, the Japanese community came uh, for trade, as I mentioned even earlier, and uh, they came for the cotton trade. Because, you know, in China and Japan, they used to use Deccan short staple cotton for uh, basically making yarn and making cloth, handloom cloth. And uh, they came here initially for trade. And a lot of our Bombay companies set up offices in Japan, like the Sassoons and the Tatas. Now, by the early 19th century, the Japanese trading companies started driving the Bombay cotton trade. They were not only exporting to Japan, because they developed a mill industry of their own, but they also started exporting Bombay cotton across the world. And Japanese Buddhism, as it was called, uh, came to Bombay around that time because it needed to cater to the spiritual needs of the resident Japanese community here in Mumbai. And as you all know that we had a Japanese uh, gymkhana. The St. Anne's School was one of the company's headquarters. There was another company headquarter in the old Siddharth College. So, you know, Bombay is fascinating because a lot of these buildings, commercial buildings and institutions still exist. They may not be functioning in the same form, but you can identify them because largely because a lot of our old, we are lucky we have our heritage buildings still here with us. But coming to the Japanese sex workers, they were actually came from very impoverished islands to the northeast of Japan. It was not the Japanese workers and executives came from all over Japan, from all over the Japanese islands. But these ladies came from what we call the Anakusa Islands, I think, in the northeast of Japan. They came from very poor fishing and farming communities. And these families, because they were so impoverished, they sold their girls, and they were called Little Miss Gone Overseas. And they sort of traveled the colonial network. So I've traced that, you know, the colonial, I mean, the first global uh, economy actually coalesced during the 19th century when these colonial port cities came. So they sort of traveled through the colonial port city network, along with other Europeans, they were Irish, they were European women, they were uh, you know, Asians, they were Southeast Asians. So even prostitution had a sort of a global overseas network. So a lot of these women even went to California during the gold rush. So, but Bombay was a nodal port, so a lot of them were here. They went into the cotton hinterland also. And they traveled along with other women from other countries through this sort of network of port cities. So what I've tried to do is, I've talked about the Japanese mission here, I've talked about the Japanese companies, I've talked about how they sort of took over the cotton, I mean, they were major players in the Bombay cotton, raw cotton trade, and then of course they had to close operations after the war, Second World War, they became an enemy nation. And, but they returned, they were amongst the first countries to return back after the war in 1948, India and Japan started trade again, so. Okay, and you know, I found the most interesting thing about Sifra's book was this chapter on the consulates and diplomats in Bombay. And I mean, from yesterday's events, yesterday's delegates dinner, 
uh, you know, European consulates, and there's so much part, and consulates generally are so much part of Bombay's cultural life, but we've never really thought about how they got here or what, what the structures are. And I think Sifra's is the first book his, uh, on Bombay to, to address that, and she looks at older European consulates that came to Bombay. So I was wondering, how did you go about researching this? Are there archives? And what are some of your, I think we spoke briefly, what are some of your plans on developing this area of research? You know, I did a, <laughs> I mean, I always believe that one must sort of get an idea first of what you're looking at and what you're looking for. I never dive into an archive without knowing what I'm looking for. So first is, of course, crystallizing the thought. And as I write and I work for a think tank, which deals with foreign relations, I've been lucky enough to have access to most of the consul generals here in Mumbai. So what I did was actually write to all of them, and I went and met them. And most of them took the trouble of looking up the history of their consulates here. So once I had, I spoke to them and I spoke to, about the companies, about the banks, about the shipping company, then I began researching. And once you research, the whole, uh, the whole story sort of comes together. So that's what I did. What I've done is uh, I've covered around the main consulates, but what I was telling you was I plan to develop this idea further because I think this is written about for the first time. And most consulates themselves were not aware of their history. So they had to write overseas to their foreign office or put me in touch with a university researcher who accessed archives. But it requires a lot more work to be done. But I thought I should just put it down there, you know, because it's an important part of Mercantile Bombay. Nari, I wanted to go back one generation. Adesha's father, Barjorji, who comes from Baruch to Bombay, settles in Grant Road in Cooper's building as per Amar Chitrakata's wonderful uh, history of, of the Godridges, um, and dabbles in real estate. Um, so I was wondering about Godridge's more recent foray into real estate, if there are any connections. Uh, but um, yeah, so how, how do you get into real estate re more recently? I don't think uh, there are any real connections between my great-grandfather's foray into real estate and our foray into real estate because that happened in the late 1980s. Uh, my brother was the mover behind that, my brother Adi. Um, uh, he felt that we had a strong brand and real estate was a business with a very poor reputation in which a strong brand would do well and he decided to build up a real estate business. So we really owe it more to Ardesha's instincts of building brands than to his father's interest in real estate. But some of the things that Sifra said made me think of links to my family. And uh, what, the only thing we have left over from the short visit to Zanzibar was he brought back an African gray parrot, which was still alive when I was a little boy. And uh, my grandfather's uh, other brother, Manche Shah, uh, taught that African gray parrot to cuss in Gujarati. <laughs> <laughs> and Manche Shah himself went on some of these trade routes. He joined the Tatars and worked in their Kobe office, <laughs> and then went to France. <laughs> And he lived in France till World War II. So <laughs> I never thought of these things, but hearing Sifra talking, I see some connections. And Sifra, I wanted to um, talk, I mean, we talk about merchants, and you have your merchant princes, the Setyas that we started with. And then you have Bombay's intelligentsia, Dadabai Noroji, Firosha Mehta, figures like that, who also have been. Uh, have been given some attention, but not like the Setyas. But in the figure of Adesha, we see a, a Bombay fellow who is, who is a, coming from a Setya background, but has a, the strains of intelligentsia as well, wanting to be a lawyer and things like that. So um, this, and I think there are other figures also in Bombay's history where you see these two strains, um, you know, the Setya intelligentsia mixing. And I was wondering um, if you've come across any figures or what you feel of these characters and are we just pigeoning them as, you know, 
Sethias when when actually it's a much broader uh, kind of. Uh, I have uh, my the thing that really comes to mind here is that most of our Bombay Sethias, I mean, what I have brought out, I mean, I haven't covered philanthropy, but I do know that Bombay was really built by its merchants. And this is what the book is about, because it's not glorifying British Bombay, it is glorifying the native merchants of Bombay. Because it says that unlike Calcutta, which was largely built by the British colonial government, Bombay was built by its merchants. Because if you go to see, a lot of these merchants built institutions, educational institutions, hospitals, uh, medical research centers, uh, institutes of science. So that is where their, the intellectual, especially for the 19th century merchants come in. So I just felt that they were more broad-minded and uh, they opened this out for all communities. They built community institutions too, like the Baghdadi Jews built their own synagogue and their own school and their own community hall as all merchant and trading communities did. But they also contributed to the city. And I think that's where the importance of our merchants come in. So uh, for example, the Royal Institute of Science, Science, it's all contributed by merchants. Yes, they also built a gateway of India, but they did build the Royal Institute of Science where you had the Sassoons, you had the Karimboy Ibrams, they have, uh, you had the other merchant families also contributing. Godrej's have contributed so much. Tata's, you know, so everyone, it's like they contributed for the well-being of the city, not just infrastructure, but education and medicine and research. So I think that's where their intellectual uh, sort of contribution comes in. I haven't studied about their education per se, but I'm talking about in a broader sense. I mean, yes. yes. Um, Ardesha studied at Elphinstone College, where Dada Bhai Naroji studied. And Dada Bhai Naroji was one of the reasons why he studied at Elphinstone College. My grandfather, Pirosha, went to VJTI to get a technical education. Uh, it, in the next generation, there were uh, varying levels of education. My uncle, Sorab, did a BSc at uh, University of Mumbai. My uncle Naval was uh, dragged in by his uh, father at the age of 16, and so he had a long career in the business. And my father was the typical middle child, very contrarian, and he decided to do a PhD in Germany. <laughs> now, do you yourself have... Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> uh, my PhD. brother decided to go to MIT, and... Uh, we had three cousins of my mother who studied at MIT, and he was influenced by them. And uh, although I uh, went first to St. Xavier's College, I spent one year at IIT. I decided to apply to MIT, and I went there. And my good friend Kishore Mariwala, who is also an MIT graduate, is, is here. And he comes from a Kachi business family. Yeah. And he also decided to become an intellectual. And I think there was, uh, uh, after a certain stage, we all felt to operate in business, we needed a good education. And I completely agree with Sifra that this uh, charity and also social responsibility in the business, the only reason my grandfather bought the land in Vikroli was because he went to some of his workers' house houses, they were living in horrible conditions, he was absolutely shocked, and when he bought land in Vikroli, which was considered the boondocks in those days, they said he was mad. Uh, but he was persistent, and he slowly moved all his factories there, and we built housing, hospitals. Uh, it, it, it's like Tata's did by building the whole city of Jamshedpur. I'm sure he was aware of those examples. And maybe even the examples of uh, the British social responsibility, like Lord Lever Hume and the Cadburys, who built company towns yes. way back then. And uh, with modern American capitalism, we've forgotten a lot of this. And now we are coming back to that. We see the response, uh, the importance of ESG 
it, it is very important and business cannot th survive if it doesn't get a license from society. And the best way to get a license from society is very good corporate social responsibility on the part of business. Um. Sifra, you, you, you've mentioned the Mariwalas and have t researched them in the book. So would you like to elaborate on your findings? Yeah. Uh, in fact, the Mariwala family is uh, a well-known Bombay family. And I don't know if there's someone in the audience from yes, the family. Sure. Oh, okay, sure. Okay. So uh, it, I, I was put on to Mr. Jay Singh Mariwala, actually, and uh, to really uh, trace the East Africa Connect. And uh, although their family is not in Oman, it turns out that Oman has got a very, very important Indian community. And it was in the wake, now much before uh, British imperialism or co colonization happened here, it was in the wake of the Omani Sultan's foray into Zanzibar and shifting to Zanzibar and making it his capital city that our Indian merchants went there. And in fact, it was my conversation with Mr. Mariwala. He said, even my family, if they got the name Mariwala from Mari, that is Pepper. Pepper. So we all know that all the European companies here came because of the trade in Pepper. They came for spices. The Portuguese came for spices, as well as the others. And uh, the trade in Pepper, as I said, mentioned earlier, was a lot of the trade when Bombay became a big port city by the 19th century, 18th and 19th century. Most trade came through Bombay. And uh, Mr. Mariwala's ancestor came to Bombay to basically work in the warehouses here. And uh, that's how their trade with the Middle East began and the Gulf regions began. So they began trading in copra and pepper, which they still do today, and sending it overseas and uh, importing dates, kara, dried fruits from the Middle East. So... Although the family never really settled there, but their connections with the community, Bhatia community there, the Boras and Kojas, another important community in the Middle East, who have come from uh, Bombay's hinterland, that is from Kutch, Gujarat, Saurashtra, Gujarat, that have played an important role in the Bombay, Gulf, Gulf East, East Africa Connect. Uh, Sifra, maybe the last question, but you know, your, your articles in, on the Gateway House website on Bombay's small communities are wonderful. Um, the, you have a series on the Iranis, you have, you're focusing on the Armenians now, and um, a little about that, and also what, what do you see as the similarities between these communities that you focus on? Um, uh, you know, uh, I've uh, like the Iranis and Armenians that you mentioned, I haven't put them in the book. Yes. Yeah, because uh, I would have liked to have had the Armenians in my book because it's a very early trading community. Uh, I found that most communities actually migrate when there's a stress at home, whether, whether it is politics. No one wants to approve, unless it's a merchant who's coming to settle here <laughs> and anchor trade from the Bombay end. Most communities really uproot themselves if there's some kind of push factor, whether it is uh, political stress, political instability, economic stress, droughts, wars, any kind of factor. So the Irani community that you spoke of and which you are an expert on, in fact, is actually came because of uh, political and even for climatic conditions, droughts. There were waves of migration. Most of these communities don't come in one wave. You have waves of migrations coming, and they found Bombay hospitable, I, you know, to, I mean, was a welcoming city, cosmopolitan port city, which they could settle in. The Armenians were the old trading community. They were settled. They were big in Surat. When Surat had a problem, they came here. So every community has their own story or push factor which attracted them to the pull factors of Bombay. So you can't really sort of put them all in one group. You have to study them and then place them chronologically because that's the only way that you get an idea. But it's not, uh, you cannot sort of make it black and white because there are so many factors that make people actually uproot themselves and shift out. It's very difficult if you have a house 
or you have property, to uproot yourself and move somewhere else and start life anew is a big decision. It's not easy. So that's why I make it a point to really start. I find that every community has different reasons why they come here. Yes. Yeah. So, and different factors, broad geopolitical factors that really push them out. Um, with that, maybe we can open for questions. Um, um, I think one might be good. Hello. So my name is Anugra, and my question to both of you, uh, you can answer. Uh, you have spoken about these uh, migration routes from Bombay to uh, the Middle East and then to the eastern of Africa. Are there any current um, uh, trade routes in Bombay going to either these locations or any other locations? And if they are, then which industries are they catering to? Nowadays, of course, trade is all over the world. Uh, and I don't think these particular routes are particularly important. Of course, the route to the Far East is still very busy with trade. China is one of India's biggest uh, trading partners. And during the years when opium went to China and tea and silks came to India, it was a big route. That continues. Trade with Africa is probably much less than it uh, used to be. Thank you. My name is Anand, and my question is on a parallel track. Are there trade, trade flows you mentioned, communities you mentioned, how about the food flows? <laughs> Anand, actually, I would have loved to tackle food, but I didn't have the word count. I wasn't given the word count to put in food. <laughs> so that's where it uh, sort of ended. <laughs> I think, I mean, one thing I found was that the Iranian food in Bombay was too bland, uh, even for, you know, a community like the Parsi. So they had to, to revamp their food in Irani restaurants. So the berry palau at Britannia didn't start out like that. It started out as a very bland chicken, chicken breast and, uh, and some rice. And then there was masala added, kebabs added, and uh, may and barishta put on top. And then you get the berry palau you see today. So with Iran, it was definitely uh, bland, but... Uh. Yeah, but Samin, you're right, because even for the Baghdadi Jews also, when they came here to India, their food was spiced up. Because, I mean, it's not, it's not the pure food, say, from Iraq, you know? I mean, everywhere, when they, when they came to India, most communities have sort of used the spices, Indian spices, it spiced up the food. So it's not the same, like if you're eating Iranian food here in Mumbai or Baghdadi food here in Mumbai, it won't be tasting the same in Iran or Baghdad. Yes, this way. Lovely session, Simon. Um, so my question is merchants. So in a sense, we're talking about capitalism. And then you're saying communities. When you think about capitalism, especially in the Western sense, there, it goes hand in hand with individualism. Um, what is it about the merchants of Bombay or these communities that made them communities that gave that sense of business that, that allowed it to carry on intergenerationally, that gave um, you know, these communities long, longevity? How did that... How did that happen? Was there kind of anything that you found in your book? And I mean, this is open to anyone. Would you like to say something? Uh, you know, I found that uh, in studying these communities, business trading communities, I haven't really covered other communities. I've concentrated on the trading communities. I find that uh, what happened was, this is like pre-colonial pre period, they were already traders. And uh, the fact is that trading then, because of the fact, because of distances, difficulty in communication, most of the trade networks were based on trust. Because without trust, you cannot trace trade over long distances. Because, uh, for example, the Armenians, if 
an Armenian trader was sent. They, it was controlled by a few big families, and they sent their own family members or their own community people overseas, that he would be given a certain amount of capital or a bolt of silk to carry and trade with. He would be away, the trader would be away, say, for two years, three years at a stretch. Now, he had to generate, with that capital, generate a certain amount of profit, and he would sell that, then he would buy something else and sell it at a greater profit, travel somewhere else. Trust, basically, is what sort of, uh, what was undergirded long-distance trade in the old days. Even today, certain communities thrive because of the trust. You cannot have, I mean, you cannot be litigating. I mean, Mr. Goldsmith will say, litigating or fighting all the time because it just hampers business. Business requires, it requires political stability. It requires security. It requires communications. And it requires, requires sound commercial, uh, you know, I instruments. You know, so in the old days, they had the hundi you know, which sort of uh, facilitated. So if you carried a hundi from po point A, from port A to port B, then it was able, you could sort of, you know, it would, it would, be, it would function as a promissory note. You could use it to raise credit. You could use it to pay someone else. So if you required financial instruments, and those instruments have essentially, even today, it's the same principle, but it's been, you know, sort of tweaked to... To, and made more sophisticated, as you call it. But underlying all this is trust. And business only happens where there is stability, where there's uh, security, and whether, when uh, there's a certain amount of freedom to function. And these communities are able to perpetuate themselves only because of trust, the, the trust they engender. That's what I have sort of, you know, I've studied different, I've studied the Bhatias, the Baghdadis, the Armenians, different communities. And I found that this is how the networks functioned in the old days. And I think that still holds true today. Yes. Well, I entirely agree with Sufra. I'd like to put it in a more economic uh, context. These traders, uh, as she said, needed to have trust. And they worked as communities. And they had somebody in each port. And they traded with each other. That was exactly the model that the Rothschilds did when they developed the business. One member of each Rothschild family was in each of the major cities. They would send news to each other very fast. They used carrier pigeons. When the telegram came, they used telegram before anybody else. And because of this trust, they would have to support the community as well. I believe that David Sassoon, when he came here, he was not really a trader, but he had a lot of followers who he had to provide a living for. So he became a trader. And then he had to support the whole community. He gave them employment, and he gave them uh, charitable things. And that happened in all the communities. Now this highly individualistic capitalism uh, comes largely from America. Of course, Adam Smith pioneered it. But Adam Smith had other books like uh, uh, what's uh, the moral sentiment uh, and things like that. People forget those books of his. And, and now we realize that this extreme individualism, uh, profit is the only motive of business, doesn't quite work. And this system was probably much better. And you know, just to add, if you look at the structure of Jamshiti Gigi Boy's companies, all these Sethias that I mentioned in the beginning were partners. So he, the, Rogai, Mohammed Ali Rogai, Moticha Amichand, who is a Hindu Sethya, they were all partners. And at the end of the day, they may not have dined together, but they will do business together. And they can dine together, they will have Pan Supari distributed at the end. And they will have their own, own staff, their own servants serving them at these parties. So your Parsi Sethya will have Parsi servants, your Hindu Sethya will have Par Hindu servants. They'll be serving them the food, but they will be doing business together. And then the Irani restaurants come and then you start dining together. But I mean, not really, but um, you're always doing business together and you are partners in every sense in these companies. So I guess um, maybe we can, we can take another oh, one, one or two more questions. Yeah, yes.
since we are on trust, were there any breaches? Is Nirav Modi the first person or there were some fraudsters? <laughs> because we haven't seen many Mumbai ads. So, uh, whether it's uh, the Kingfisher guy or Ramalinga Raju, none of them are Mumbai ads. Nirav Modi happens <laughs> to be the first. That's a very good point. <laughs> <laughs> well, even in the past, there were a lot, you know, I mean, in the old days, they used to have what were called a council of elders, most of the communities. So I know, for, for example, the Baghdadi Jews, even pre-colonial period in their trading, they had, you were answerable to, if there was a breach of trust, you were literally ostracized. You could not trade. So the thing is, they had their own way of... Um, you know, sort of bringing everyone in line and ensuring and engendering and ensuring that there was trust in their network. Because if a trader, God forbid, broke his word or cheated or basically sort of uh, tampered with the accounts and he was found out, then he would probably be made either to pay or he would be basically outcast. Now, even coming to the book, even in Zanzibar, there was, a, there was a consular court there and a lot of Indian merchants who sort of fought or, you know, they had uh, disputes. Someone didn't pay. It would first be heard in the consular court in Zanzibar and then it would come to the high court here in Mumbai. So, in Bombay and Bombay of that time. And a lot of these cases are there. Actually, the records are there in the Bombay High Court of fights between traders. So it's, it's human nature. History is all about his story. It's about human beings. So human nature doesn't change whether you're talking about the 18th century or you're talking about the 21st century. Yes, there must be Nira Modi's then too. <laughs> yes. I'd just like to know a little bit more about the opium trade. Uh, wasn't that a very immoral um, uh, trade? And was there no opposition to it from some of the traders? Uh, see, traders are going to trade. It was a, you know, the interesting thing about the opium trade was the East India Company did not dirty its hands with opium. They encouraged the trade in Calcutta. In fact, they controlled the trade because right from the growing of opium, the processing of opium, transporting it to Calcutta port, was all done by the East India Company. They even auctioned the opium. But they did not trade in it because it was illegal in China. From 1729, the emperor had actually said that opium was an illegal import and opium could not be grown there in China. But it was because there was such a drain of silver from the English treasury into China buying tea because tea was tea and silk was so popular in Europe and in England that they didn't know how to sort of come up with another product that could replace silver. And the Chinese only wanted silver. So when opium trade, it, it had started way, er, way earlier. It wasn't something new that just the British started opium trading. Opium trading has been going on since the 8th century, almost. And it became so popular with the, uh, with the Chinese people when the smuggling began. But the smuggling was done by Indian merchants and European merchants, the private merchants. The companies kept out of it. The companies would only take the payment or the silver from the merchants, give them bills of exchange and said, go back to India or go back to England and take your money. So it was immoral. It shouldn't have been there. It led to three trade wars, the opium wars, and it led to three treaties of humiliation, according to the Chinese. And uh, yes, I mean, but then in business, I think business and morality, there's a thin, uh, thin dividing line between the two. And uh, Xi Jinping to this day resents it. And it was, some of his unusual thinking is because of this narrative. Just as Putin has his own uh, slighted narratives for all that he is doing. Uh, but I believe, uh, as she said, opium was always traded. But 
if I'm not mistaken, originally it was consumed in small quantities and it has medicinal uses. Uh, people in Europe used to take opium as a painkiller and sometimes as a drug. Morphine. Morphine. Yes. Oh. And Coleridge uh, is supposed to have written, was it Coleridge? Uh, Shanadu under, uh, uh, under the influence of opium. And he was suddenly woken up and he couldn't complete the poem because uh, his reverie was lost. So a certain amount of opium was quite normal and maybe they rationalized it that way. But when people started smoking opium, it became much more dangerous, I believe. And that was the change. That was the real immoral thing. And that's the history. <laughs> Thank you so much. Please pick up. Sifra's book and this, I don't know if it's available outside, but this is a wonderful history of the Codridges and for your kids as well. So see you next time. Yeah, <laughs>